Book Three, Chapter Nine of Last Days of Pompeii. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Anne Boulay. Last Days of Pompeii by Edward G. Bulwer Lytton. Book Three, Chapter Nine Storm in the South, The Witch's Cavern. It was when the heats of noon died gradually away from the earth that Glaucus and Ione went forth to enjoy the cool and grateful air. At that time, various carriages were in use among the Romans. The one most used by the richer citizens, when they required no companion in their excursion, was the biga, already described in the early portion of this work. That appropriated to the matrons was termed the carpentum, which had commonly two wheels. The ancients used also a sort of litter, a vast sedan chair, more commodiously arranged than the modern, inasmuch as the occupant thereof could lie down at ease, instead of being perpendicularly and stiffly jostled up and down. There was another carriage, used both for traveling and for excursions in the country. It was commodious, containing three or four persons with ease, having a covering which could be raised at pleasure, and, in short, answering very much the purpose of, though very different in shape from, the modern brisca. It was a vehicle of this description that the lovers, accompanied by one female slave of Ione, now used in their excursion. About ten miles from the city, there was at that day an old ruin, the remains of a temple, evidently Grecian. And as for Glaucus and Ione, everything Grecian possessed an interest. They had agreed to visit these ruins. It was thither they were now bound. Their road lay among vines and olive groves, till, winding more and more towards the higher ground of Vesuvius, the path grew rugged. The mules moved slowly, and with labor, and at every opening in the wood they beheld those gray and horrent caverns indenting the parched rock, which Strabo has described, but which the various revolutions of time and the volcano have removed from the present aspect of the mountain. The sun, sloping towards his descent, cast long and deep shadows over the mountain. Here and there they still heard the rustic reed of the shepherd amongst copses of the beechwood and wild oak. Sometimes they marked the form of the silk-haired and graceful capella, with its wreathing horn and bright gray eye, which, still beneath the Ausonian skies, recalls the eclogues of Morrow, browsing halfway up the hills. And the grapes, already purple with the smiles of the deepening summer, glowed out from the arch festoons, which hung pendant from tree to tree. Above them, light clouds floated in the serene heavens, sweeping so slowly athwart the firmament that they scarcely seemed to stir, while, on their right, they caught, ever and anon, glimpses of the waveless sea, with some light bark skimming its surface, and the sunlight breaking over the deep in those countless and softest hues so peculiar to that delicious sea. How beautiful, said Glaucus, in a half-whispered tone, is that expression by which we call earth our mother. With what a kindly equal love she pours her blessings upon her children, and even to those sterile spots to which nature has denied beauty, she yet contrives to dispense her smiles. Witness the arbutus and the vine, which she wreathes over the arid and burning soil of yon extinct volcano. Ah, in such an hour and scene as this, well might we imagine that the fawn should peep forth from those green festoons, or that we might trace the steps of the mountain nymph through the thickest mazes of the glade, but the nymphs ceased, beautiful Ione, when thou wert created. There is no tongue that flatters like a lover's, and yet, in the exaggeration of his feelings, flattery seems to him commonplace, strange and prodigal exuberance, which soon exhausts itself by overflowing. They arrived at the ruins, they examined them with that fondness with which we trace the hallowed and household vestiges of our own ancestry. They lingered there till Hesperus appeared in the rosy heavens, and then returning homeward in the twilight, they were more silent than they had been, for in the shadow and beneath the stars they felt more oppressively their mutual love. It was at this time that the storm which the Egyptian had predicted began to creep visibly over them. At first, a low and distant thunder gave warning of the approaching conflict of the elements, and then rapidly rushed above the dark ranks of the serried clouds. The suddenness of storms in that climate is something almost preternatural, and might well suggest to early superstition the notion of a divine agency. A few large drops broke heavily among the boughs that half overhung their path, 
and then swift and intolerably bright the forked lightning darted across their very eyes and was swallowed up by the increasing darkness swifter good carucarius said glaucus to the driver the tempest comes on apace the slave urged on the mules they went swift over the uneven and stony road the clouds thickened near and more near broke the thunder and fast rushed the dashing rain dost thou fear whispered glaucus as he sought excuse in the storm to come nearer to ione not with thee she said softly at that instant the carriage fragile and ill contrived as despite their graceful shapes were for practical uses most of such inventions at that time struck violently into a deep rut over which lay a log of fallen wood the driver with a curse stimulated his mules yet faster for the obstacle the wheel was torn from the socket and the carriage suddenly overset glaucus quickly extricating himself from the vehicle hastened to assist ione who was fortunately unhurt with some difficulty they raised the caruca or carriage and found that it ceased any longer even to afford them shelter the springs that fastened the covering were snapped asunder and the rain poured fast and fiercely into the interior in this dilemma what was to be done they were yet some distance from the city no house no aid seemed near there is said the slave a smith about a mile off i could seek him and he might fasten at least the wheel of the caruca by jupiter how the rain beats my mistress will be wet before i come back run thither at least said glaucus we must find the best shelter we can till you return the lane was overshadowed with trees beneath the amplest of which glaucus drew ione he endeavored by stripping his own cloak to shield her yet more from the rapid rain but it descended with a fury that broke through all puny obstacles and suddenly while glaucus was yet whispering courage to his beautiful charge the lightning struck one of the trees immediately before them and split with a mighty crash its huge trunk in twain this awful incident apprised them of the danger they braved in their present shelter and glaucus looked anxiously round for some less perilous place of refuge we are now he said halfway up the ascent of vesuvius there ought to be some cavern or hollow in the vine-clad rocks could we but find it in which the deserting nymphs have left a shelter while thus saying he moved from the trees and looking wistfully toward the mountain discovered through the advancing gloom a red and tremulous light at no considerable distance that must come he said from the hearth of some shepherd or vine dresser it will guide us to some hospitable retreat wilt thou stay here while i yet no that would be to lead thee to danger i will go with you cheerfully said ione open as the space seems it is better than the treacherous shelter of these boughs half leading half carrying ione glaucus accompanied by the trembling female slave advanced toward the light which yet burned red and steadfastly at length the space was no longer open wild vines entangled their steps and hid from them save by imperfect intervals the guiding beam but faster and fiercer came the rain and the lightning assumed its most deadly and blasting form they were still therefore impelled onward hoping at last if the light eluded them to arrive at some cottage or some friendly cavern the vines grew more and more intricate the light was entirely snatched from them but a narrow path which they trod with labor and pain guided only by the constant and long lingering flashes of the storm continued to lead them towards its direction the rain ceased suddenly precipitous and rough crags of scorched lava frowned before them rendered more fearful by the lightning that illumined the dark and dangerous soil sometimes the blaze lingered over the iron-gray heaps of scoria covered in part with ancient mosses or stunted trees as if seeking in vain for some gentler product of earth more worthy of its ire and sometimes leaving the whole of that part of the scene in darkness the lightning broad and sheeted hung redly over the ocean tossing far below until its waves seemed glowing into fire and so intense was the blaze that it brought vividly into view even the sharp outline of the more distant windings of the bay from the eternal messenum with its lofty brow to the beautiful sorrentum and the giant hills behind our lover stopped in perplexity and doubt when suddenly as the darkness that gloomed between the fierce flashes of lightning once more wrapped them round they saw near but high before them the mysterious light 
another blaze in which heaven and earth were reddened made visible to them the whole expanse no house was near but just where they had beheld the light they thought they saw in the recess of the cavern the outline of a human form the darkness once more returned the light no longer pale beneath the fires of heaven burned forth again they resolved to ascend towards it they had to wind their way among vast fragments of stone here and there overhung with wild bushes but they gained nearer and nearer to the light and at length they stood opposite the mouth of a kind of cavern apparently formed by huge splinters of rock that had fallen traversely athwart each other and looking into the gloom each drew back involuntarily with a superstitious fear and chill a fire burned in the far recess of the cave and over it was a small cauldron on a tall and thin column of iron stood a rude lamp over that part of the wall at the base of which burned the fire hung in many rows as if to dry a profusion of herbs and weeds a fox crouched before the fire gazed upon the strangers with its bright and red eye its hair bristling and a low growl stealing from between its teeth in the center of the cave was an earthen statue which had three heads of a singular and fantastic cast they were formed by the real skulls of a dog a horse and a boar a low tripod stood before this wild representation of the popular hecate but it was not these appendages and appliances of the cave that thrilled the blood of those who gazed fearfully therein it was the face of its inmate before the fire with the light shining full upon her features sat a woman of considerable age perhaps in no country are there seen so many hags as in italy in no country does beauty so awfully change in age to hideousness the most appalling and revolting but the woman now before them was not one of these specimens of the extreme of human ugliness on the contrary her countenance betrayed the remains of a regular but high and aquiline order of feature with stony eyes turned upon them with a look that met and fascinated theirs they beheld in that fearful countenance the very image of a corpse the same the glazed and lustreless regard the blue and shrunken lips the drawn and hollow jaw the dead lank hair of a pale gray the vivid green ghastly skin which seemed all surely tinged and tainted by the grave it is a dead thing said glaucus nay it stirs it is a ghost or larva faltered ione as she clung to the athenian's breast oh away away groaned the slave it is the witch of vesuvius who are ye said a hollow and ghostly voice and what do ye hear the sound terrible and death-like as it was suiting well the countenance of the speaker and seeming rather the voice of some bodiless wanderer of the styx than living mortal would have made ione shrink back into the pitiless fury of the storm but glaucus though not without some misgiving drew her into the cavern we are storm-beaten wanderers from the neighboring city he said and decoyed hither by yon light we crave shelter and the comfort of your hearth as he spoke the fox rose from the ground and advanced towards the strangers showing from end to end its white teeth and deepening in its menacing growl down slave said the witch and at the sound of her voice the beast dropped at once covering its face with its brush and keeping only its quick vigilant eye fixed upon the invaders of its repose come to the fire if ye will said she turning to glaucus and his companions i never welcome living things save the owl the fox the toad and the viper so i cannot welcome ye but come to the fire without welcome why stand upon form the language in which the hag addressed them was a strange and barbarous latin interlarded with many words of some more rude and ancient dialect she did not stir from her seat but gazed stonily upon them as glaucus now released ione of her outer wrapping garments and making her place herself on a log of wood which was the only other seat he perceived at hand fanned with his breath the embers into a more glowing fire the slave encouraged by the boldness of her superiors divested herself also of her long pala and crept timorously to the opposite corner of the hearth we disturb you i fear said the silver voice of ione in conciliation the witch did not reply she seemed like one who has awakened for a moment from the dead and has then relapsed once more into the eternal slumber tell me she said suddenly and after a long pause are ye brother and sister no said ione blushing are ye married 
Not so, replied Glaucus. Ho, lovers! Ha, 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 ha. And the witch laughed so loud and so long that the caverns rang again. The heart of Ione stood still at that strange mirth. Glaucus muttered a rapid counterspell to the omen, and the slave turned as pale as the cheek of the witch herself. Why dost thou laugh, old crone? said Glaucus, somewhat sternly, as he concluded his invocation. Did I laugh? said the hag absently. She is in her dotage, whispered Glaucus. As he said this, he caught the eye of the hag fixed upon him with a malignant and vivid glare. Thou liest, she said abruptly. Thou art an uncourteous welcomer, returned Glaucus. Hush, provoke her not, dear Glaucus, whispered Ione. I will tell thee why I laughed when I discovered ye were lovers, said the old woman. It was because it is a pleasure to the old and withered to look upon young hearts like yours, and to know the time will come when you will loathe each other. Loathe! Loathe! Ha 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 ha! It was now Ione's turn to pray against the unpleasing prophecy. The gods forbid, she said. Yet, poor woman, thou knowest little of love, or thou wouldst know that it never changes. Was I young once, think ye, returned the hag quickly, and am I old and hideous and deathly now? Such as is the form, so is the heart. With these words she sank again into a stillness profound and fearful, as if the cessation of life itself. Hast thou dwelt here long? said Glaucus, after a pause, feeling uncomfortably oppressed beneath the silence so appalling. Ah, long, yes, it is but a drear abode. Ha! Huh, thou mayest well say that. Hell is beneath us, replied the hag, pointing her bony finger to the earth, and I will tell thee a secret. The dim things below are preparing wrath for ye above, you, the young, and the thoughtless, and the beautiful. Thou utterest but evil words, ill becoming the hospitable, said Glaucus, and in future I will brave the tempest rather than thy welcome. Thou wilt do well. None shall ever seek me, save the wretched. And why the wretched? asked the Athenian. I am the witch of the mountain, replied the sorceress, with a ghastly grin. My trade is to give hope to the hopeless. For the crossed in love I have filters. For the avaricious, promises of treasure. For the malicious, potions of revenge. For the happy and the good, I have only what life has. Curses! Trouble me no more. With this, the grim tenant of the cave relapsed into a silence so obstinate and sullen that Glaucus in vain endeavored to draw her into further conversation. She did not evince, but any alteration of her locked and rigid features, that she even heard him. Fortunately, however, the storm, which was brief as violent, began now to relax. The rain grew less and less fierce, and at last, as the clouds parted, the moon burst forth in the purple opening of heaven, and streamed clear and full into that desolate abode. Never had she shone, perhaps, on a group more worthy of the painter's art. The young, the all-beautiful Ione, seated by that rude fire, her lover, already forgetful of the presence of the hag, at her feet, gazing upward to her face, and whispering sweet words, the pale and affrighted slave at a little distance, and the ghastly hag resting her deadly eyes upon them, yet seemingly serene and fearless, for the companionship of love hath such power, were these beautiful beings, things of another sphere, in that dark and unholy cavern, with his gloomy quaintness of appurtenance. The fox regarded them from his corner with his keen and fiery eye, and as Glaucus now turned towards the witch, he perceived for the first time, just under her seat, the bright gaze and crested head of a large snake. Whether it was that vivid coloring of the Athenian's cloak, thrown over the shoulders of Ione, attracted the reptile's anger. Its crest began to glow and rise, as if menacing and preparing itself to spring upon the Neapolitan. Glaucus caught quickly at one of the half-burned logs upon the hearth, and, as if enraged at the action, the snake came forth from its shelter, and with a loud hiss raised itself on end till its height nearly approached that of the Greek. Witch, cried Glaucus, command thy creature, or thou wilt see it dead. It has been despoiled of its venom, said the witch, aroused at his threat, but ere the words had left her lip, the snake had sprung upon Glaucus. Quick and watchful, the agile Greek leaped lightly aside, and struck so fell and dexterous a blow on the head of the snake, that it fell prostrate and writhing among the embers of the fire. 
the hag sprung up and stood confronting glaucus with a face which would have befitted the fiercest of the furies so utterly dire and wrathful was its expression yet even in horror and ghastliness preserving the outline and trace of beauty and utterly free from that coarse grotesque at which the imaginations of the north have sought the source of terror thou hast she said in a slow and steady voice which belied the expression of her face so much was it passionless and calm thou hast had shelter under my roof and warmth at my hearth thou hast returned evil for good thou hast smitten and haply slain the thing that loved me and was mine nay more the creature above all others consecrated to gods and deemed venerable by man now hear thy punishment by the moon who is the guardian of the sorceress by orcus who is the treasure of wrath i curse thee and thou art cursed may thy love be blast may thy name be blackened may the infernals mark thee may thy heart wither and scorch may thy last hour recall to thee the prophet voice of the saga of vesuvius and thou she added turning sharply towards ione and raising her right arm when glaucus burst impetuously on her speech hag he cried forbear me thou hast cursed and i commit myself to the gods i defy and scorn thee but breathe but one word against yon maiden and i will convert the oath on thy foul lips to thy dying groan beware i have done replied the hag laughing wildly for in thy doom is she who loves the accursed and not the less that i heard her lips breathe thy name and know by what word to commend thee to the demons glaucus thou art doomed so saying the witch turned from the athenian and kneeling down beside her wounded favorite which she dragged from the hearth she turned to them her face no more o oh, glaucus said ione greatly terrified what have we done let us hasten from this place the storm has ceased good mistress forgive him recall thy words he meant but to defend himself accept this peace offering to unsay the said and ione stooping placed her purse on the hag's lap away she said bitterly away the oath once woven the fates only can untie away come dearest said glaucus impatiently thinkest thou that the gods above us or below hear the impotent ravings of dotage come long and loud rang the echoes of the cavern with the dread laugh of the saga she deigned no further reply the lovers breathed more freely when they gained the open air yet the scene they had witnessed the words and the laughter of the witch still fearfully dwelt with dione and even glaucus could not thoroughly shake off the impression they had bequeathed the storm had subsided save now and then a low thunder muttered in the distance amidst the darker clouds or a momentary flash of lightning affronted the sovereignty of the moon with some difficulty they regained the road where they found the vehicle already sufficiently repaired for their departure and the carucarius calling loudly upon hercules to tell him where his charge had vanished glaucus vainly endeavored to cheer the exhausted spirits of ione and scarce less vainly to recover the elastic tone of his own natural gaiety they soon arrived before the gate of the city as it opened to them a litter borne by slaves impeded their way it is too late for egress cried the sentinel to the inmate of the litter not so said a voice which the lovers started to hear it was a voice they well recognized i am bound to the villa of marcus polybius i shall return shortly i am arbaces the egyptian the scruples of him at the gate were removed, and the litter passed close beside the carriage that bore the lovers. Are Bases at this hour? Scarce recovered too, methinks? Whither or for what can he leave the city? said Glaucus. Alas, replied Ione, bursting into tears, my soul feels still more and more the omen of evil. Preserve us, O ye gods, or at least, she murmured inly, preserve my Glaucus. End of Book 3, Chapter 9《10. Of Last Days of Pompeii. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Anne Boulay. Last Days of Pompeii by Edward G. Bulwer Lytton. Book 3, Chapter 10. The Lord of the Burning Belt and His Minion. 
fate writes her prophecy in red letters but who shall read them arbaces had tarried only till the cessation of the tempest allowed him under cover of night to seek the saga of vesuvius borne by those of his trustier slaves in whom in all more secret expeditions he was accustomed to confide he lay extended along his litter and resigning his sanguine heart to the contemplation of vengeance gratified and love possessed the slaves in so short a journey moved very little slower than the ordinary pace of mules and arbaces soon arrived at the commencement of a narrow path which the lovers had not been fortunate enough to discover but which skirting the thick vines led at once to the habitation of the witch here he rested the litter and bidding his slaves conceal themselves and the vehicle among the vines from the observation of any chance passenger he mounted alone with steps still feeble but supported by a long staff the drear and sharp ascent not a drop of rain fell from the tranquil heaven but the moisture dripped mournfully from the laden boughs of the vine and now and then collected in tiny pools in the crevices and hollows of the rocky way strange passions these for a philosopher thought arbaces that lead one like me just new from the bed of death and lapped even in health amidst the roses of luxury across such nocturnal paths as this but passion and vengeance treading to their goal can make an elysium of a tartarus high clear and melancholy shone the moon above the road of that dark wayfarer glossing herself in every pool that lay before him and sleeping in shadow along the sloping mount he saw before him the same light that had guided the steps of his intended victims but no longer contrasted by the blackened clouds it shone less redly clear he paused as at length he approached the mouth of the cavern to recover breath and then with his wonted collected and stately mien he crossed the unhallowed threshold the fox sprang up at the ingress of this newcomer and by a long howl announced another visitor to his mistress the witch had resumed her seat and her aspect of grave-like and grim repose by her feet upon a bed of dry weeds which half covered it lay the wounded snake but the quick eye of the egyptian caught its scales glittering in the reflected light of the opposite fire as it writhed now contracting now lengthening its folds in pain and unsated anger down slave said the witch as before to the fox and as before the animal dropped to the ground mute but vigilant rise servant of nox and erebus said arbaces commandingly a superior in thine art salutes thee rise and welcome him at these words the hag turned her gaze upon the egyptian's towering form and dark features she looked long and fixedly upon him as he stood before her in his oriental robe and folded arms and steadfast and haughty brow who art thou she said at last that callest thyself greater in art than the saga of the burning fields and the daughter of the perished etrurian race i am he answered arbaces from whom all cultivators of magic from north to south from east to west from the ganges and the nile to the vales of thessaly and the shores of the yellow tiber have stooped to learn there is but one such man in these places answered the witch whom the men of the outer world unknowing his loftier attributes and more secret fame call arbaces the egyptian to us of a higher nature and deeper knowledge his rightful appellation is hermes of the burning girdle look again returned arbaces i am he as he spoke he drew aside his robe and revealed a cincture seemingly of fire that burned round his waist clasped in the centre by a plate whereupon was engraven some sign apparently vague and unintelligible but which was evidently not unknown to the saga she rose hastily and threw herself at the feet of arbaces i have seen then said she in a voice of deep humility the lord of the mighty girdle vouchsafe my homage rise said the egyptian i have need of thee so saying he placed himself on the same log of wood on which ione had rested before and motioned to the witch to resume her seat thou sayest said he as she obeyed that thou art a daughter of the ancient etrurian tribes the mighty walls of those rock-built cities yet frown above the robber race that hath seized upon their ancient reign partly came those tribes from greece 
partly were they exiles from a more burning and primeval soil in either case thou art of egyptian lineage for the grecian masters of the aboriginal helot were among the restless sons whom the nile banished from her bosom equally then o saga thy descent is from ancestors that swore allegiance to mine own by birth and by knowledge art thou the subject of our bases hear me then and obey the witch bowed her head whatever art we possess in sorcery continued our bases we are sometimes driven to natural means to attain our object the ring and the crystal and the ashes and the herbs do not give unerring divinations neither do the higher mysteries of the moon yield even the possessor of the girdle a dispensation from the necessity of employing ever and anon human measures for a human object mark me then thou art deeply skilled methinks in the secrets of the more deadly herbs thou knowest those which arrest life which burn and scorch the soul from out her citadel or freeze the channels of young blood into that ice which no sun can melt do i overrate thy skill speak and truly mighty hermes such lore is indeed mine own deign to look at these ghostly and corpse-like features they have waned from the hues of life merely by watching over the rank herbs which simmer night and day in yon cauldron the egyptian moved his seat from so unblessed and so unhealthful a vicinity as the witch spoke it is well he said thou hast learned that maxim of all the deeper knowledge which saith despise the body to make wise the mind but to thy task there cometh to thee by to-morrow's starlight a vain maiden seeking of thine art a love charm to fascinate from another the eyes that should utter but soft tales to her own instead of thy filters give the maiden one of thy most powerful poisons let the lover breathe his vows to the shades the witch trembled from head to foot oh pardon pardon dread master said she falteringly but this i dare not the law in these cities is sharp and vigilant they will seize they will slay me for what purpose then thy herbs and thy potions vain saga said arbaces sneeringly the witch hid her loathsome face with her hands oh years ago she said in a voice unlike her usual tones so plaintive was it and so soft i was not the thing that i am now i loved i fancy myself beloved and what connection hath thy love witch with my commands said arbaces impetuously patience resumed the witch patience i implore you i loved another and less fair than i yes by nemesis less fair allured from me my chosen i was of that dark etrurian tribe to whom most of all were known the secrets of the gloomier magic my mother was herself a saga she shared the resentment of her child from her hands i received the potion that was to restore me his love and from her also the poison that was to destroy my rival oh crush me dread walls my trembling hands mistook the files my lover fell indeed at my feet but dead 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 since then what has been life to me i became suddenly old i devoted myself to the sorceries of my race still by an irresistible impulse i curse myself with an awful penance still i seek the most noxious herbs still i concoct the poisons still i imagine that i am to give them to my hated rival still i pour them into the phial still i fancy that they shall blast her beauty to the dust still i wake and see the quivering body the foaming lips the gazing eyes of my Alice, murdered and by me the skeleton frame of the witch shook beneath strong convulsions arbaces gazed upon her with a curious though contemptuous eye and this foul thing has yet human emotions thought he still she cowers over the ashes of the same fire that consumes our bases such are we all mystic is the tie of those mortal passions that unite the greatest and the least he did not reply till she had somewhat recovered herself and now sat rocking to and fro in her seat with glassy eyes fixed on the opposite flame and large tears rolling down her livid cheeks a grievous tale is thine in truth said arbaces but these emotions are fit only for our youth age should harden our hearts to all things but ourselves 
as every year adds a scale to the shellfish, so should each year wall and encrust the heart. Think of these frenzies no more. And now, listen to me again, by the revenge that was dear to thee, I command thee to obey me. It is for vengeance that I seek thee. This youth whom I would sweep from my path has crossed me, despite my spells. This thing of purple embroidery, of smiles and glances, soulless and mindless, with no charm but that of beauty. Accursed be it, this insect, this Glaucus, I tell thee, by Orcus and by Nemesis, he must die. And working himself up at every word, the Egyptian, forgetful of his debility, of his strange companion, of everything but his own vindictive rage, strode, with large and rapid steps, the gloomy cavern. Glaucus, sayest thou, mighty master, said the witch abruptly, and her dim eye glared at the name with all that fierce resentment, at the memory of small affronts so common amongst the solitary and the shunned. Aye, so he is called, but what matters the name? Let it not be heard as that of a living man three days from this date. Hear me, said the witch, breaking from a short reverie into which she was plunged after this last sentence of the Egyptian. Hear me, I am thy thing and thy slave, spare me. If I give to the maiden thou speakest of that which would destroy the life of Glaucus, I shall be surely detected, the dead ever find avengers. Nay, dread man, if thy visit to me be tracked, if thy hatred to Glaucus be known, thou mayest have need of thy arch's magic to protect thyself. Ha! said Arbaces, stopping suddenly short, and as a proof of that blindness with which passion darkens the eyes even of the most acute. This was the first time when the risk that he himself ran by this method of vengeance had occurred to a mind ordinarily wary and circumspect. But, continued the witch, if instead of that which arrests the heart, I give that which shall sear and blast the brain, which shall make him who quaffs it unfit for the uses and career of life, an abject, raving, benighted thing, smiting sense to driveling youth, to dotage, will not thy vengeance be equally sated, thy object equally attained? Oh, witch, no longer the servant but the sister, the equal of our bases. How much brighter is woman's wit, even in vengeance, than ours? How much more exquisite than death is such a doom? And, continued the hag, gloating over her fell scheme, in this is but little danger, for by ten thousand methods, which men forbear to seek, can our victim become mad? He may have been among the vines and seen a nymph, or the vine itself may have had the same effect. Ha, <laughs> ha! They never inquire too scrupulously into these matters in which the gods may be agents. And let the worst arrive. Let it be known that it is a love charm. Why, madness is a common effect of filters. And even the fair, she that gave it, finds indulgence in the excuse. Mighty Hermes, have I ministered to thee cunningly? Thou shalt have twenty years longer date for this, returned Arbaces. I will write anew the epic of thy fate on the face of the pale stars. Thou shalt not serve in vain the master of the flaming belt. And here, Saga, carve thee out, by these golden tools, a warmer cell in this dreary cavern. One service to me shall countervail a thousand divinations by sieve and shears to the gaping rustics. So saying, he cast upon the floor a heavy purse, which clinked not unmusically to the ear of the hag, who loved the consciousness of possessing the means to purchase comforts she disdained. Farewell, said Arbaces, fail not. Outwatch the stars in concocting thy beverage. Thou shalt lord it over thy sisters at the walnut tree. When thou tellest them thy patron and thy friend is Hermes the Egyptian, to-morrow night we meet again. He stayed not to hear the valediction or the thanks of the witch, with a quick step, he passed into the moonlit air and hastened down the mountain. The witch, who followed his steps to the threshold, stood at the entrance of the cavern, gazing fixedly on his receding form, and as the sad moonlight streamed over her shadowy form and death-like face, emerging from the dismal rocks, it seemed as if one gifted, indeed, by supernatural magic, had escaped from the dreary Orcus, and the foremost of its ghostly throng stood at its black portals vainly summoning his return, or vainly sighing to rejoin him. 
the hag then slowly re-entering the cave groaningly picked up the heavy purse took the lamp from its stand and passing to the remotest depth of her cell a black and abrupt passage which was not visible save at a near approach closed round as it was with jutting and sharp crags yawned before her she went several yards along this gloomy path which sloped gradually downwards as if towards the bowels of the earth and lifting a stone deposited her treasure in a hole beneath which as the lamp pierced its secrets seemed already to contain coins of various value wrung from the credulity or gratitude of her visitors i love to look at you she said apostrophizing the monies for when i see you i feel that i am indeed of power and i am to have twenty years longer life to increase your store o oh, thou great hermes she replaced the stone and continued her path onward for some paces when she stopped before a deep irregular fissure in the earth here as she bent strange rumbling hoarse and distant sounds might be heard while ever and anon with a loud and grating noise which to use a homely but faithful simile seemed to resemble the grinding of steel upon wheels volumes of streaming and dark smoke issued forth and rushed spiraling along the cavern the shades are noisier than their wont said the hag shaking her gray locks and looking into the cavity she beheld far down glimpses of a long streak of light intensely but darkly red strange she said shrinking back it is only within the last two days that dull deep light hath been visible what can it portend the fox who had attended the steps of his fell mistress uttered a dismal howl and ran cowering back to the inner cave a cold shuddering seized the hag herself at the cry of the animal which causeless as it seemed the superstitions of the time considered deeply ominous she muttered her placatory charm and tottered back into her cavern where amidst her herbs and incantations she prepared to execute the orders of the egyptian he called me dotard said she as the smoke curled from the hissing cauldron when the jaws drop and the grinders fall and the heart scarce beats it is a pitiable thing to dote but when she added with a savage and exulting grin the young and the beautiful and the strong are suddenly smitten into idiocy ah that is terrible burn flame simmer herb swelter toad i curse him and he shall be cursed on that night and at the same hour which witnessed the dark and unholy interview between arbaces and the saga apacides was baptized End of Book 3, Chapter 10、11. Of Last Days of Pompeii. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Anne Boulay. Last Days of Pompeii by Edward G. Bulwer Lytton. Book 3, Chapter 11. Progress of Events. The Plot Thickens. The Web is Woven, but the Net Changes Hands. And you have the courage, then, Julia, to seek the Witch of Vesuvius this evening, in company, too, with that fearful man? Why, Nydia, replied Julia timidly, dost thou really think there is anything to dread? These old hags, with their enchanted mirrors their trembling sieves and their moon-gathered herbs are i imagine but crafty impostors who have learned perhaps nothing but the very charm for which i apply to their skill and which is drawn from the knowledge of the fields herbs and simples wherefore should i dread dost thou not fear thy companion what are bases by diane i never saw a lover more courteous than that same magician and were he not so dark he would be even handsome blind as she was nydia had the penetration to perceive that julia's mind was not one that the gallantries of arbaces were likely to terrify she therefore dissuaded her no more but nursed in her excited heart the wild and increasing desire to know if sorcery had indeed a spell to fascinate love to love let me go with thee noble julia she said at length my presence is no protection but i should like to be beside thee to the last thine offer pleases me much replied the daughter of diomed 
yet how canst thou contrive it we may not return until late they will miss thee ione is indulgent replied nydia if thou wilt permit me to sleep beneath thy roof i will say that thou an early patroness and friend hast invited me to pass the day with thee and sing thee my thessalian songs her courtesy will readily grant to thee so light a boon nay ask for thyself said the haughty julia i stoop to request no favor from the neapolitan well be it so i will take my leave now make my request which i know will be readily granted and return shortly do so and thy bed shall be prepared in my own chamber with that nydia left the fair pompeian on her way back to ione she was met by the chariot of glaucus on whose fiery and curveting steeds was riveted the gaze of the crowded street he kindly stopped for a moment to speak to the flower girl blooming as thine own roses my gentle nydia and how is thy fair mistress recovered i trust from the effects of the storm i have not seen her this morning answered nydia but but what draw back the horses are too near thee but think you ione will permit me to pass the day with julia the daughter of diomed she wishes it and was kind to me when i had few friends the gods bless thy grateful heart i will answer for ione's permission then may i stay over the night and return to-morrow said nydia shrinking from the praise she so little merited as thou and fair julia please commend me to her and hark ye nydia when thou hearest her speak note the contrast of her voice with that of the silver-toned ione Bale. his spirits entirely recovered from the effect of the past night his locks waving in the wind his joyous and elastic heart bounding with every spring of his parthian steeds a very prototype of his country's god full of youth and of love glaucus was born rapidly to his mistress enjoy while ye may the present who can read the future as the evening darkened julia reclined within her litter which was capacious enough also to admit her blind companion took her way to the rural baths indicated by arbaces to her natural levity of disposition her enterprise brought less of terror than of pleasurable excitement above all she glowed at the thought of her coming triumph over the hated neapolitan a small but gay group was collected round the door of the villa as her litter passed by it to the private entrance of the baths appropriated to the women methinks by this dim light said one of the bystanders i recognize the slaves of diomed true clodius said Salust. it is probably the litter of his daughter julia she is rich my friend why dost thou not proffer thy suit to her why i had once hoped that glaucus would have married her she does not disguise her attachment and then as he gambles freely and with ill success the sesterstes would have passed to thee wise clodius a wife is a good thing when it belongs to another man but continued clodius as glaucus is i understand to wed the neapolitan i think i must even try my chance with the dejected maid after all the lamp of hymen will be gilt and the vessel will reconcile one to the odor of the flame i shall only protest my salust against diomed's making thee trustee to his daughter's fortune ha ha let us within my commisitor the wine and the garlands await us dismissing her slaves to that part of the house set apart for their entertainment julia entered the baths with nydia and declining the offers of the attendants passed by a private door into the garden behind she comes by appointment be sure said one of the slaves what is that to thee said a superintendent sourly she pays for the baths and does not waste the saffron such appointments are the best part of the trade hark do you not hear the widow fulvia clapping her hands run fool run julia and nydia avoiding the more public part of the garden arrived at the place specified by the egyptian in a small circular plot of grass the stars gleamed upon the statue of Selinus. the merry god reclined upon a fragment of rock the links of bacchus at his feet and over his mouth he held with extended arm a bunch of grapes which he seemingly laughed to welcome ere he devoured i see not the magician said julia looking round when as she spoke the egyptian slowly emerged from the neighboring foliage and the light fell palely over his sweeping robes salve sweet maiden but ha whom hast thou here we must have no companions it is but the blind flower girl wise magician replied julia 
herself a Thessalian. Oh, Nydia, said the Egyptian, I know her well. Nydia drew back and shuddered. Thou hast been at my house, methinks, said he, approaching his voice to Nydia's ear. Thou knowest the oath, silence and secrecy, now as then, or beware. Yet, he added musingly to himself, why confide more than is necessary, even in the blind? Julia, canst thou trust thyself alone with me? Believe me, the magician is less formidable than he seems. As he spoke, he gently drew Julia aside. The witch loves not many visitors at once, said he. Leave Nydia here till your return. She can be of no assistance to us, and, for protection, your own beauty suffices, your own beauty and your own rank. Yes, Julia, I know thy name and birth. Come, trust thyself with me, fair rival of the youngest of the naiads. The vain Julia was not, as we have seen, easily affrighted. She was moved by the flattery of Arbaces, and she readily consented to suffer Nydia to await her return. Nor did Nydia press her presence. At the sound of the Egyptian's voice, all her terror of him returned. She felt a sentiment of pleasure at learning she was not to travel in his companionship. She returned to the bathhouse, and in one of the private chambers waited their return. Many and bitter were the thoughts of this wild girl as she sat there in her eternal darkness. She thought of her own desolate fate, far from her native land, far from the bland cares that once assuaged the April sorrows of childhood, deprived of the light of day, with none but strangers to guide her steps, accursed by the one soft feeling of her heart, loving and without hope, save the dim and unholy ray which shot across her mind, as her Thessalian fancies questioned of the force of spells and the gifts of magic. Nature had sown in the heart of this poor girl the seeds of virtue never destined to ripen. The lessons of adversity were not always salutary. Sometimes they softened and amend, but as often they indurate and pervert. If we consider ourselves more harshly treated by fate than those around us, and do not acknowledge in our own deeds the justice of the severity, we become too apt to deem the world our enemy, to case ourselves in defiance, to wrestle against our softer self, and to indulge the darker passions which are so easily fermented by the sense of injustice. Sold early into slavery, sentenced to a sordid taskmaster, exchanging her situation, only yet more to embitter her lot, the kindlier feelings, naturally profuse in the breast of Nydia, were nipped and blighted. Her sense of right and wrong was confused by a passion to which she had so madly surrendered herself, and the same intense and tragic emotions which we read of in the women of the classic age, a Mira, a Medea, and which hurried and swept away the whole soul when once delivered to love, ruled and rioted in her breast. Time passed. A light step entered the chamber where Nydia yet indulged her gloomy meditations. Oh, thank me, the immortal gods, said Julia. I have returned. I have left that terrible cavern. Come, Nydia, let us away forthwith. It was not till they were seated in the litter that Julia spoke again. Oh, she said, tremblingly, such a scene, such fearful incantations, and the dead face of the hag. But let us talk not of it. I have obtained the potion. She pledges its effect. My rival shall be suddenly indifferent to his eye. And I, I alone, the idol of Glaucus. Glaucus, exclaimed Nydia. I, I told thee, girl, at first, that it was not the Athenian whom I loved. But I see now that I may trust thee wholly. It is the beautiful Greek. What then were Nydia's emotions? She had connived, she had assisted, in tearing Glaucus from Ione but only to transfer, by all the power of magic, his affections yet more hopelessly to another. Her heart swelled almost to suffocation. She gasped for breath. In the darkness of the vehicle, Julia did not perceive the agitation of her companion. She went on rapidly dilating on the promised effect of her acquisition, and on her approaching triumph over Ione, every now and then abruptly digressing to the horror of the scene she had quitted, the unmoved mien of Arbaces, and his authority over the dreadful saga. Meanwhile, Nydia recovered her self-possession. A thought flashed across her. She slept in the chamber of Julia. She might possess herself of the potion. They arrived at the house of Diomed, and descended to Julia's apartment, where the night's repast awaited them. Drink, Nydia. Thou must be cold. 
the air was chill to-night as for me my veins are yet ice and julia unhesitatingly quaked deep draughts of the spiced wine thou hast the potion said nydia let me hold it in my hands how small the phial is of what color is the draught clear as crystal replied julia as she retook the filter thou couldst not tell it from this water the witch assures me it is tasteless small though the phial it suffices for a life's fidelity it is to be poured into any liquid and glaucus will only know what he has quaffed by the effect exactly like this water in appearance yes sparkling and colorless as this how bright it seems it is as the very essence of moonlit dews bright thing how thou shinest on my hopes through thy crystal vase and how is it sealed but by one little stopper i withdraw it now the draught gives no odor strange that that which speaks to neither sense should thus command all is the effect instantaneous usually but sometimes it remains dormant for a few hours oh how sweet is this perfume said nydia suddenly as she took up a small bottle on the table and bent over its fragrant contents thinkest thou so the bottle is set with gems of some value thou wouldst not have the bracelet yester morn wilt thou take the bottle it ought to be such perfumes as these that should remind one who cannot see of the generous julia if the bottle be not too costly oh i have a thousand costlier ones take it child nydia bowed her gratitude and placed the bottle in her vest and the draught would be equally efficacious whoever administers it if the most hideous hag beneath the sun bestowed it such is its asserted virtue that glaucus would deem her beautiful and none but her julia warmed by the wine and the reaction of her spirits was now all animation and delight she laughed loud and talked on a hundred matters nor was it till the night had advanced far towards morning that she summoned her slaves and undressed when they were dismissed she said to nydia i will not suffer this holy draught to quit my presence till the hour comes for its use lie under my pillow bright spirit and give me happy dreams so saying she placed the potion under her pillow nydia's heart beat violently why dost thou drink that unmixed water nydia take the wine by its side i am fevered replied the blind girl and the water cools me i will place this bottle by my bedside it refreshes in these summer nights when the dews of sleep fall not on our lips fair julia i must leave thee very early so ione bids perhaps before thou art awake accept therefore now my congratulations thanks when next we meet you may find glaucus at my feet they had retired to their couches and julia worn out by the excitement of the day soon slept but anxious and burning thoughts rolled over the mind of the wakeful thessalian she listened to the calm breathing of julia and her ear accustomed to the finest distinctions of sound speedily assured her of the deep slumber of her companion now befriend me venus she said softly she rose gently and poured the perfume from the gift of julia upon the marble floor she rinsed it several times carefully with the water that was beside her and then easily finding the bed of julia for night to her was as day she pressed her trembling hand under the pillow and seized the potion julia stirred not her breath regularly fanned the burning cheek of the blind girl nydia then opening the phial poured its contents into the bottle which easily contained them and then refilling the former reservoir of the potion with that limpid water which julia had assured her it so resembled she once more placed the phial in its former place she then stole again to her couch and waited with what thoughts the dawning day the sun had risen julia slept still nydia noiselessly dressed herself placed her treasure carefully in her vest took up her staff and hastened to quit the house the porter meaden saluted her kindly as she descended the steps that led to the street she heard him not her mind was confused and lost in the whirl of tumultuous thoughts each thought of passion she felt the pure morning air upon her cheek but it cooled not her scorching veins glaucus she murmured all the love charms of the wildest magic could not make thee love me as i love thee ione ah away hesitation away remorse glaucus my fate is in thy smile and thine hope o oh, joy o oh, transport thy fate is in these hands end of book three chapter eleven
Chapter 1 of Last Days of Pompeii. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Christine Blashford. Last Days of Pompeii by Edward G. Bulwer Lytton. Book 4, Chapter 1. Reflections on the zeal of the early Christians. Two men come to a perilous resolve. Walls have ears, particularly sacred walls. Whoever regards the early history of Christianity will perceive how necessary to its triumph was that fierce spirit of zeal, which, fearing no danger, accepting no compromise, inspired its champions and sustained its martyrs. In a dominant church, the genius of intolerance betrays its cause. In a weak and persecuted church, the same genius mainly supports. It was necessary to scorn, to loathe, to abhor the creeds of other men, in order to conquer the temptations which they presented. It was necessary rigidly to believe not only that the gospel was the true faith, but the sole truth faith that saved, in order to nerve the disciple to the austerity of its doctrine, and to encourage him to the sacred and perilous chivalry of converting the polytheist and the heathen. The sectarian sternness which confined virtue and heaven to a chosen few, which saw demons in other gods and the penalties of hell in other religions, made the believer naturally anxious to convert all to whom he felt the ties of human affection, and the circle thus traced by benevolence to man was yet more widened by a desire for the glory of God. It was for the honour of the Christian faith that the Christian boldly forced its tenets upon the scepticism of some, the repugnance of others, the sage contempt of the philosopher, the pious shudder of the people. His very intolerance supplied him with his fittest instruments of success, and the soft heathen began at last to imagine there must indeed be something holy in a zeal wholly foreign to his experience, which stopped at no obstacle, dreaded no danger, and even at the torture or on the scaffold referred a dispute far other than the calm differences of speculative philosophy to the tribunal of an eternal judge. It was thus that the same fervour which made the churchman of the Middle Age a bigot without mercy made the Christian of the early days a hero without fear. Of these more fiery, daring and earnest natures, not the least ardent was Olynthus. No sooner had Apicides been received by the rites of baptism into the bosom of the church than the Nazarene hastened to make him conscious of the impossibility to retain the office and robes of priesthood. He could not, it was evident, profess to worship God and continue even outwardly to honour the idolatrous altars of the fiend. Nor was this all the sanguine and impetuous mind of Olynthus beheld in the power of Apicides, the means of divulging to the deluded people the juggling mysteries of the oracular Isis. He thought heaven had sent this instrument of his design in order to disabuse the eyes of the crowd and prepare the way, perchance, for the conversion of a whole city. He did not hesitate then to appeal to all the new-kindled enthusiasm of Apicides to arouse his courage and to stimulate his zeal. They met, according to previous agreement, the evening after the baptism of Apicides, in the grove of Cybele, which we have before described. At the next solemn consultation of the oracle, said Olynthus, as he proceeded in the warmth of his address, advance yourself to the railing, proclaim aloud to the people the deception they endure, invite them to enter, to be themselves the witness of the gross but artful mechanism of imposture thou hast described to me. Fear not, the Lord who protected Daniel shall protect thee. We, the community of Christians, will be amongst the crowd, we will urge on the shrinking, and in the first flush of the popular indignation and shame, I myself, upon those very altars, will plant the palm branch typical of the gospel, and to my tongue shall descend the rushing spirit of the living God. Heated and excited as he was, this suggestion was not unpleasing to Apicides. He was rejoiced at so early an opportunity of distinguishing his faith in his new sect, and to his holier feelings were added those of a vindictive loathing at the imposition he had himself suffered, and a desire to avenge it. In that sanguine and elastic overbound of obstacles, the rashness necessary to all who undertake venturous and lofty actions, neither Olynthus nor the proselyte perceived the impediments to the success of their scheme, which might be found in the reverent superstition of the people themselves, who would probably be loath, before the sacred altars of the great Egyptian goddess, to believe even the testimony of her priest against her power. Apicides then assented to this proposal with a readiness which delighted Olynthus. They parted with the understanding that Olynthus should confer with the more important of his Christian brethren on his great enterprise, should receive their advice and their assurances of the support on the eventful day. 
It so chanced that one of the festivals of Isis was to be held on the second day after this conference. The festival proffered a ready occasion for the design. They appointed to meet once more on the next evening at the same spot, and in that meeting were finally to be settled the order and details of the disclosure for the following day. It happened that the later part of this conference had been held near the Sassalum, or small chapel, which I have described in the early part of this work, and so soon as the forms of the Christian and the priest had disappeared from the grove, a dark and ungainly figure emerged from behind the chapel. "'I have tracked you with some effect, my brother Flamen," soliloquized the eavesdropper. "'You, the priest of Isis, have not for mere idle discussion conferred with this gloomy Christian. Alas, that I could not hear all your precious plot. Enough, I find at least that you meditate revealing the sacred mysteries, and that to-morrow you meet again at this place to plan the how and the when. May Osiris sharpen my ears then, to detect the whole of your unheard-of audacity.' When I have learned more, I must confer at once with our bases. We will frustrate you, my friends, deep as you think yourselves. At present, my breast is a locked treasury of your secret. Thus muttering, Calenus, for it was he, wrapped his robe around him and strode thoughtfully homeward. End of chapter 1 Chapter 2 of Last Days of Pompeii This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Christine Blashford. Last Days of Pompeii by Edward G. Bulwer Lytton. Book 4, Chapter 2. A Classic Host, Cook and Kitchen, Apisides Seeks Ione, Their Conversation. It was then that the day for Diomed's banquet to the most select of his friends, the graceful Glaucus, the beautiful Ione, the official Panzer, the high-born Clodius, the immortal Fulvius, the exquisite Lepidus, the Epicurean Sallust, were not the only honourers of his festival. He expected also an invalid senator from Rome, a man of considerable repute and favour at court, and a great warrior from Herculaneum, who had fought with Titus against the Jews, and having enriched himself prodigiously in the wars, was always told by his friends that his country was eternally indebted to his disinterested exertions. The party, however, extended to a yet greater number, for although critically speaking it was at one time thought inelegant among the Romans to entertain less than three or more than nine at their banquets, yet this rule was easily disregarded by the ostentatious, and we are told, indeed, in history, that one of the most splendid of these entertainers usually feasted a select party of three hundred. Diomed, however, more modest, contented himself with doubling the number of the muses. His party consisted of eighteen, no unfashionable number in the present day. It was the morning of Diomed's banquet, and Diomed himself, though he greatly affected the gentleman and the scholar, retained enough of his mercantile experience to know that a master's eye makes a ready servant. Accordingly, with his tunic ungirdled on his portly stomach, his easy slippers on his feet, a small wand in his hand, wherewith he now directed the gaze, and now corrected the back of some duller menial, he went from chamber to chamber of his costly villa. He did not disdain even a visit to that sacred apartment in which the priests of the festival prepare their offerings. On entering the kitchen, his ears were agreeably stunned by the noise of dishes and pans, of oaths and commands. Small as this indispensable chamber seems to have been in all the houses of Pompeii, it was nevertheless usually fitted up with all that amazing variety of stoves and shapes, stew pans and saucepans, cutters and moulds, without which a cook of spirit, no matter whether he be an ancient or a modern, declares it utterly impossible that he can give you anything to eat. And as fuel was then, as now, dear and scarce in those regions, great seems to have been the dexterity exercised in preparing as many things as possible with as little fire. An admirable contrivance of this nature may be still seen in the Neapolitan Museum, viz. a portable kitchen about the size of a folio volume, containing stoves for four dishes and an apparatus for heating water or other beverages. Across the small kitchen flitted many forms which the quick eye of the master did not recognise. Oh, oh, grumbled he to himself, that cursed Congrio hath invited a whole legion of cooks to assist him. They won't serve for nothing, and this is another item in the total of my day's expenses. By Bacchus, thrice lucky shall I be if the slaves do not help themselves to some of the drinking vessels. Ready, alas, are their hands, capacious are their tunics. Me, miserum. The cooks, however, worked on, seemingly heedless of the apparition of Diomed. Ho, oh, Euclio, your egg-pan, what, is this the largest? It only holds thirty-three eggs. In the houses I usually serve, the smallest egg-pan holds fifty, if need be. The unconscionable rogue, thought Diomed. He talks of eggs as if they were a sesterce a hundred. 
by mercury cried a pert little culinary disciple scarce in his novitiate whoever saw such antique sweatmeat shapes as these it is impossible to do credit to one's art with such rude materials why sallust's commonest sweetmeat shape represents the whole siege of troy hector and paris and helen with little astyanax and the wooden horse into the bargain silence fool said congrio the cook of the house who seemed to leave the chief part of the battle to his allies my master diomed is not one of those expensive good-for-noughts who must have the last fashion cost what it will thou liest base slave cried diomed in a great passion and thou costest me already enough to have ruined lucullus himself come out of thy den i want to talk to thee the slave with a sly wink at his confederates obeyed the command man of three letters said diomed with his face of solemn anger how didst thou dare to invite all those rascals into my house i see thief written in every line of their faces yet i assure you master that they are men of most respectable character the best cooks of the place it is a great favour to get them but for my sake thy sake unhappy congrio interrupted diomed and by what purloined monies of mine by what reserved filchings from marketing by what goodly meats converted into grease and sold in the suburbs by what false charges for bronzes marred and earthenware broken hast thou been enabled to make them serve thee for thy sake nay master do not impeach my honesty may the gods desert me if swear not again interrupted the choleric diomed for then the gods will smite thee for a perjurer and i shall lose my cook on the eve of dinner but enough of this at present keep a sharp eye on thy ill-favoured assistance and tell me no tales to-morrow of vases broken and cups miraculously vanished or thy whole back shall be one pain and hark thee thou knowest thou hast made me pay for those phrygian attachins enough by hercules to have feasted a sober man for a year together see that they be not one iota over roasted the last time o congrio that i gave a banquet to my friends when thy vanity did so boldly undertake the becoming appearance of a melian crane thou knowest it came up like a stone from aetna as if all the fires of phlegathon had been scorching out its juices be modest this time congrio wary and modest modesty is the nurse of great actions and in all other things as in this if thou wilt not spare thy master's purse at least consult thy master's glory there shall not be such a coena seen at pompeii since the days of hercules softly softly thy cursed boasting again but i say congrio yon homunculus yon pygmy assailant of my cranes yon pert-tongued neophyte of the kitchen was there aught but insolence on his tongue when he maligned the comeliness of my sweetmeat shapes i would not be out of the fashion congrio it is but the custom of us cooks replied congrio gravely to undervalue our tools in order to increase the effect of our art the sweetmeat shape is a fair shape and a lovely but i would recommend my master at the first occasion to purchase some new ones of a that will suffice exclaimed diomed who seemed resolved never to allow his slave to finish his sentences now resume thy charge shine eclipse thyself let men envy diomed his cook let the slaves of pompey style thee congrio the great go yet stay thou hast not spent all the monies i gave thee for the marketing all alas the nightingale's tongues and the roman temacula and the oysters from britain and sundry other things too numerous now to recite are yet left unpaid for but what matter every one trusts the archimagerus of diomed the wealthy o oh, unconscionable prodigal what waste what profusion i am ruined but go hasten inspect taste perform surpass thyself let the roman senator not despise the poor pompeian away slave and remember the phrygian atogens the chief disappeared within his natural domain and diomed rolled back his portly presence to the more courtly chambers all was to his liking the flowers were fresh the fountains played briskly the mosaic pavements were as smooth as mirrors where is my daughter julia he asked at the bath ah that reminds me time wanes and i must bathe also our story returns to apicides on awaking that day from the broken and feverish sleep which had followed his adoption of a faith so strikingly and sternly at variance with that in which his youth had been nurtured the young priest could scarcely imagine that he was not yet in a dream he had crossed the fatal river the past was henceforth to have no sympathy with the future the two worlds were distinct and separate that which had been from that which was to be to what a bold and adventurous enterprise he had pledged his life to unveil the mysteries in which he had participated to desecrate the altars he had served to denounce the goddess whose ministering robe he wore slowly he became sensible of the hatred and the horror he should provoke amongst the pious even if successful if frustrated in his daring attempt what penalties might he not incur for an offence hitherto unheard of for which no specific law derived from experience was prepared and which for that very reason precedents dragged from the sharpest armoury of obsolete and inapplicable legislation would probably be distorted to meet 
his friends the sister of his youth could he expect justice though he might receive compassion from them this brave and heroic act would by their heathen eyes be regarded perhaps as a heinous apostasy at the best as a pitiable madness he dared he renounced everything in this world in the hope of securing that eternity in the next which had so suddenly been revealed to him while these thoughts on the one hand invaded his breast on the other hand his pride his courage and his virtue mingled with reminiscences of revenge for deceit of indignant disgust at fraud conspired to raise and to support him the conflict was sharp and keen but his new feelings triumphed over his old and a mighty argument in favour of wrestling with the sanctities of old opinions and hereditary forms might be found in the conquest over both achieved by that humble priest had the early christians been more controlled by the solemn plausibilities of custom less of democrats in the pure and lofty acceptation of that perverted word christianity would have perished in its cradle as each priest in succession slept several nights together in the chambers of the temple the term imposed on apicides was not yet completed and when he had risen from his couch attired himself as usual in his robes and left his narrow chamber he found himself before the altars of the temple in the exhaustion of his late emotions he had slept far into the morning and the vertical sun already poured its fervid beams over the sacred place salve apicides said a voice whose natural asperity was smoothed by long artifice into an almost displeasing softness of tone thou art late abroad has the goddess revealed herself to thee in visions could she reveal her true self to the people calenus how insenseless would be these altars that replied calenus may possibly be true but the deity is wise enough to hold commune with none but priests a time may come when she will be unveiled without her own acquiescence it is not likely she has triumphed for countless ages and that which has so long stood the test of time rarely succumbs to the lust of novelty but hark ye young brother these sayings are indiscreet it is not for thee to silence them replied apicides haughtily so hot yet i will not quarrel with thee why my apicides has not the egyptian convinced thee of the necessity of our dwelling together in unity has he not convinced thee of the wisdom of deluding the people and enjoying ourselves if not o oh brother he is not that great magician he is esteemed thou then hast shared his lessons said apicides with a hollow smile ay but i stood less in need of them than thou nature had already gifted me with the love of pleasure and the desire of gain and power long is the way that leads the voluptuary to the severities of life but it is only one step from pleasant sin to sheltering hypocrisy beware the vengeance of the goddess if the shortness of that step be disclosed beware thou the hour when the tomb shall be rent and the rottenness exposed returned apicides solemnly vale with these words he left the flamen to his meditations when he got a few paces from the temple he turned to look back calenus had already disappeared in the entry-room of the priests for it now approached the hour of that repast which called prandium by the ancients answers in point of date to the breakfast of the moderns the white and graceful fane gleamed brightly in the sun upon the altars before it rose the incense and bloomed the garlands the priest gazed long and wistfully upon the scene it was the last time that it was ever beheld by him he then turned and pursued his way slowly towards the house of ione for before possibly the last tie that united them was cut in twain before the uncertain peril of the next day was incurred he was anxious to see his last surviving relative his fondest as his earliest friend he arrived at her house and found her in the garden with nydia this is kind apicides said ione joyfully and how eagerly have i wished to see thee what thanks do i not owe thee how churlish hast thou been to answer none of my letters to abstain from coming hither to receive the expressions of my gratitude oh thou hast assisted to preserve thy sister from dishonour what what can she say to thank thee now thou art come at last my sweet ione thou owest me no gratitude for thy cause was mine let us avoid that subject let us recur not to that impious man how hateful to both of us I may have a speedy opportunity to teach the world the nature of his pretended wisdom and hypocritical severity. But let us sit down, my sister. I am wearied with the heat of the sun. Let us sit in yonder shade, and, for a little while longer, be to each other what we have been. Beneath a wide plane tree, with the cistus and the arbutus clustering round them, the living fountain before, the greenswood beneath their feet, the gay cicada, once so dear to Athens, rising merrily ever and anon amidst the grass, the butterfly beautiful emblem of the soul dedicated to psyche and which has continued to furnish illustrations to the christian bard rich in the glowing colours caught from sicilian skies hovering about the sunny flowers itself like a winged flower in this spot and this scene the brother and the sister sat together for the last time on earth 
you may tread now on the same place but the garden is no more the columns are shattered the fountain has ceased to play let the traveller search amongst the ruins of pompeii for the house of ione its remains are yet visible but i will not betray them to the gaze of commonplace tourists he who is more sensitive than the herd will discover them easily when he has done so let him keep the secret they sat down and nydia glad to be alone retired to the farther end of the garden ione my sister said the young convert place your hand upon my brow let me feel your cool touch speak to me too for your gentle voice is like a breeze that hath freshness as well as music speak to me but forbear to bless me utter not one word of those forms of speech which our childhood was taught to consider sacred alas and what then shall i say our language of affection is so woven with that of worship that the words grow chilled and trite if i banish from them allusion to our gods our gods murmured apicides with a shudder thou slightest my request already shall i speak then to thee only of isis the evil spirit no rather be dumb for ever unless at least thou canst but away away this talk not now will we dispute and cavil not now will we judge harshly of each other thou regarding me as an apostate and i all sorrow and shame for thee as an idolater no my sister let us avoid such topics and such thoughts in thy sweet presence a calm falls over my spirit for a little while i forget as i thus lay my temples on thy bosom as i thus feel thy gentle arm embrace me i think that we are children once more and that the heaven smiles equally upon both for oh if hereafter i escape no matter what peril and it be permitted me to address thee on one sacred and awful subject should i find thine ear closed and thy heart hardened what hope for myself could countervail the despair for thee in thee my sister i behold a likeness made beautiful made noble of myself shall the mirror live for ever and the form itself be broken as the potter's clay ah no no thou wilt listen to me yet dost thou remember how we went into the fields by bay hand in hand together to pluck the flowers of spring even so hand in hand shall we enter the eternal garden and crown ourselves with imperishable asphodel wondering and bewildered by words she could not comprehend but excited even to tears by the plaintiveness of their tone i only listened to these outpourings of a full and oppressed heart in truth apicides himself was softened much beyond his ordinary mood which to outward seeming was usually either sullen or impetuous for the noblest desires are of a jealous nature they engross they absorb the soul and often leave their splenetic humours stagnant and unheeded at the surface unheeding the petty things around us we are deemed morose impatient at earthly interruption to the diviner dreams we are thought irritable and churlish for as there is no chimera vainer than the hope that one human heart shall find sympathy in another so none ever interrupt us with justice and none no not our nearest and our dearest ties forbear with us in mercy when we are dead and repentance comes too late both friend and foe may wonder to think how little there was in us to forgive i will talk to thee then of our early years said ione shall yon blind girl sing to thee of the days of childhood her voice is sweet and musical and she hath a song on that theme which contains none of those allusions it pains thee to hear dost thou remember the words my sister asked apicides methinks yes for the tune which is simple fixed them on my memory sing to me then thyself my ear is not in unison with unfamiliar voices and thine ione full of household associations has ever been to me more sweet than all the hireling melodies of lycia or of crete sing to me ione beckoned to a slave that stood in the portico and sending for her lute sang when it arrived to a tender and simple air the following verses regrets for childhood it is not that our earlier heaven escapes its april showers or that to childhood's heart is given no snake amidst the flowers ah twined with grief each brightest leaf that's wreathed us by the hours young though we be the past may sting the present feed its sorrow but hope shines bright on everything that waits us with the morrow like sunlight glades the dimmest shades some rosy beam can borrow it is not that our later years of cares are woven wholly but smiles less swiftly chase the tears and wounds are healed more slowly and memory's vow to lost ones now makes joys too bright unholy and ever fled the iris bow that smiled when clouds were o'er us if storms should burst uncheered we go a drearier waste before us and with the toys of childish joys we've broke the staff that bore us wisely and delicately had i only chosen that song sad though its burthen seemed for when we are deeply mournful discordant above all others is the voice of mirth the fittest spell is that borrowed from melancholy itself for dark thoughts can be softened down when they cannot be brightened and so they lose the precise and rigid outline of their truth and their colours melt into the ideal 
as the leech applies in remedy to the internal sore some outward irritation which by a gentler wound draws away the venom of that which is more deadly thus in the rankling festers of the mind our art is to divert to a milder sadness on the surface the pain that gnaweth at the core and so with Apicides, yielding to the influence of the silver voice that reminded him of the past and told but of half the sorrow born to the present he forgot his more immediate and fiery sources of anxious thought he spent hours in making ione alternately sing to and converse with him and when he rose to leave her it was with a calm and lulled mind ione said he as he pressed her hand should you hear my name blackened and maligned will you credit the aspersion never my brother never dost thou not imagine according to thy belief that the evil doer is punished hereafter and the good rewarded can you doubt it dost thou think then that he who is truly good should sacrifice every selfish interest in his zeal for virtue he who doth so is the equal of the gods and thou believest that according to the purity and courage with which he thus acts shall be his portion of bliss beyond the grave so we are taught to hope kiss me my sister one question more thou art to be wedded to glaucus perchance that marriage may separate us more hopelessly but not of this speak i now thou art to be married to glaucus dost thou love him nay my sister answer me by words yes murmured ione blushing dost thou feel that for his sake thou couldst renounce pride brave dishonour and incur death i have heard that when women really love it is to that excess my brother all this i could do for glaucus and feel that it were not a sacrifice there is no sacrifice to those who love in what is born for the one we love enough shall woman feel thus for man and man feel less devotion to his god he spoke no more his whole countenance seemed instinct and inspired with a divine life his chest swelled proudly his eyes glowed on his forehead was writ the majesty of a man who can dare to be noble he turned to meet the eyes of ione earnest wistful fearful he kissed her fondly strained her warmly to his breast and in a moment more he had left the house long did ione remain in the same place mute and thoughtful the maidens again and again came to warn her of the deepening noon and her engagement to diomed's banquet at length she woke from her reverie and prepared not with the pride of beauty but listless and melancholy for the festival one thought alone reconciled her to the promised visit she should meet glaucus she could confide to him her alarm and uneasiness for her brother End of chapter two